Hello, Nerdy Romantics. OMG, I am just like giddy right now. I've been giddy for a little while on this one because we are going to talk today about the Netflix series Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story. It is on Netflix at the moment of this recording. And it is, actually, we've had two, it is inspired by the Bridgerton television series. So we'll be talking about Queen Charlotte. We'll be talking about the Bridgerton series. So far, what we know of the Bridgerton TV series, which are seasons one and two, so we will be getting into this, which means there will be spoiler alerts, everybody. Oh, I've just given free reign to all my guests. We will spoil everything. So if you have watched Queen Charlotte, listen with us. This is the Nerdy Romantics Podcast, and I'm your host, Y.M. Nelson. everybody. Today we've got on the podcast with us Stacy, Pam, Dana, Marcy, and Jen with us. And they've all been with us at some point on one or two or more of our podcasts. And I'll let them each have their moment a little bit later. (laughs) But in true Bridgerton slash Queen Charlotte slash Shonda Rhimes fashion. I'm going to start this off kind of like how they started. They explained to us at the very first episode that Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story, is inspired by Bridgerton. There are some things that we are going to take liberty with. So yes, there are some fictional things, but uh, some of this is based on fact. And in that fashion, I'll talk about a little bit of history. Yes, womp womp. I'm not a history teacher, but I noticed as I was kind of talking about this with a few other folks online, a lot of them were saying that they were going to Google and trying to figure out what's true, what's not true, what's purely Bridgerton, the TV series, the the books, X, Y, Z. So I'm going to go through what I know. Jen, you are a romance, we'll say connoisseur, (laughs) but she's also a book coach and an editor, everybody, for the writers out there. That romance novel connoisseur. Oh, I like it. (laughs) Yeah. So as far as the novel part, none of us have read the novels here. Except maybe Jen. Jen, have you read these novels? The Bridgerton I, novels? I, I have read one of the Bridgerton novels. I have not read the Queen Charlotte book. Okay. All right. So we won't be talking a lot about novel versus what we see, but we'll definitely talk TV series versus what we're seeing here. So here's a rundown of the facts. Okay. Queen Charlotte and King George III, they were real king and queen, and they were married for 57 years. They had 15 children. You see 13 of them in the show because 13 of them lived to be adults. When when King George had his mental breaks and they had to actually have a regent, the regent was George IV. And he's also the one who his daughter, the Princess Royal, died. Queen Charlotte is Queen Victoria's grandma. So the baby at the end that they're talking about, we think it's going to be a girl. It was actually Queen Victoria, who is up until Queen Elizabeth II that I know of. Queen Victoria was the longest reigning queen in the UK. King George, yes, he definitely was mentally ill. 
obviously, if we have no cure for mental illness right now, we obviously did not have it at that time. And so at that time, they did not even know what he had. Some are speculating that he had what we call today bipolar disorder. It looked a little bit also like he had a little bit of schizophrenia. They did call him Mad King George. And there's also been a lot of talk about Queen Charlotte and race and that Queen Charlotte was definitely proven in the 90s. I think they've been researching this since the 60s. But Queen Charlotte was directly descended from Black Portuguese royals. So by our standards today, she would be considered mixed race. I don't know what they would have said in England back in those days, and I'm not going to go into that. She did love botany, and there are a couple of scenes in episode three where she's talking about the Christmas tree. Queen Charlotte was the one who brought the Christmas tree from Germany to England, and that's how England got the Christmas tree. It is said that she, quote unquote, discovered Mozart, but there is some disagreement that she this actually discovered Mozart because Mozart was doing a circuit at the time and she was part of that. So those are the facts about Queen Charlotte and the history part, about the books and everything like that. There is a book out now called, of course, Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story. That book is co-written by Julia Quinn and Shonda Rhimes. For those, I've looked at a few of the reviews for it, and a lot of people say it basically follows the show. So that is interesting, considering that, and this is the one unsure part that I have, is as far as I know, Lady Danbury in the series that was written in the actual Bridgerton series, novel series, is not Black, but the show does go into a lot of her backstory, and a lot of her backstory has to do with race, which we can talk about later. The hardback edition of this book has a reversible dust jacket, which is totally awesome. And so that's that about the book. Are we cool with that? Let's talk about the show, (laughs) y'all. So like I said, we have with us Dana, Marcy, Pam, Jen, Stacy, And Marcy, how about we start with you? Tell us kind of, as we always do, before you started watching Queen Charlotte, what did you think? Were you excited about it? Where did you hear about it? What was going through your mind? I know you are a big BBC fan. So tell us, what did you think? So So before going in, I was excited to see the prequel. I follow Shondaland, Netflix. So I've been getting updates along the way. So I expected it to be a Shondaland creation. So I was not necessarily expecting it to stay true to all historical facts. So going into it, I was looking for Queen Charlotte's backstory. I don't think I was expecting the way that it was done. I was expecting a good story, but I was not expecting to see so much of the elder Queen Queen Charlotte. In, In my mind, I just, because it was a prequel, I kind of assumed we would see the majority younger, but I liked that piece. It gave me everything I was expecting. And I think Shonda did a good job of creating this story on her own. You know, Julia Quinn will say she didn't have anything to do with this particular story. So Shonda and her co-writers and the creators, I think, did a really good job with adding personality and that Bridgerton flair to a historic story and giving it a life and a depth that I think some people might not ever have known, whether you ever get the whole historical perspective, just to get to know these two characters, I think was a really special moment. Okay, cool. Pam, what did you think going in? And were you excited about this? 
or was it a little bit of us kind of telling you, hey, watch Queen Charlotte? <laughs> How did you guess that? Yes, I, <laughs> I think it really, in the beginning, it was, oh, yeah, you need to watch it since we've gone through Bridgerton. But once I decided I wanted to watch it, I did watch the little spoiler that shows up on Netflix. So I didn't get a whole lot from that. But what I was looking for was I was hoping to like Queen Charlotte because I wasn't this big fan of hers. I recognized that she was queen and it was a certain way she needed to present herself. But it wasn't, most of the time, it wasn't a kind, you know, relationship with all the people. So I was looking forward to liking her. And I think as I watched it, Queen Charlotte, I began to like her and understand her more. She was not my favorite character, but I'm glad that at least the thing that I was looking forward to going in that I would begin to like her. I did begin to like who she was and who she and what she stood for. Okay, interesting. All right, Dana, what about you? What did you think going in? So similar to Pam, I was not necessarily excited. This was like an assignment. And since I had seen the other two seasons of Bridgerton, and I knew we were going to talk about it, I was going to watch it. Now, part of the lack of excitement was because I knew there was going to be a show, but I didn't know anything else. So I know Marcy mentioned whether it was going to be about the young queen or the older. I had no idea. I hadn't seen a trailer, nothing. (laughs) So it was kind of like, hey, we're going to watch this. And I was like, okay. (laughs) So that's where it was. And I will go ahead and put this this out here because maybe as we talk it'll come out it'll be obvious I did not finish the series (laughs) and and not because I didn't like it I was on episode six and we were going to discuss it and I was like well I'm not finished yet I don't know how long it'll take me to finish it and then somebody busted my bubble was like Dana episode six is the last episode and I was like what so I probably have 30 to 40 minutes of episode six I did not watch because I feel some kind of way about it. Now I did go and read, so I kind of know how it ended, like no aha surprises or anything. But I think for me, I felt like the limited series, I think had I known that, I don't even know if I would have watched it. Some of you know, I'm a gotta have at least two two uh, seasons under your belt for me to get invested because it takes a lot of time to watch this stuff and get invested only to have it go off or be canceled. Now, the only reason I'm not that harsh on this one is because I know it's a continuation with the other Bridgerton seasons that'll come out. So we're going to see more of these people I expect. But I will say, as we're talking, you may notice that I don't speak on anything that happened at the very end because I did not watch it. Okay. Jen, what about you? When you heard Queen Charlotte was going to be a thing, yeah, tell us your impressions. So I was super excited because I love a royal story. I I love sort of that upstairs, downstairs type of a story. And one of the things I really, really appreciated about the first two seasons of Bridgerton is that the little glimpses that we did get of Queen Charlotte, we had such gorgeous, the clothing is gorgeous. The sets are sumptuous. Like I really love the visual that we got when we were in the palace with the queen. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And there's this little hint, right? We get these little tiny instances of her relationship with the king. And and it was it was kind of a curiosity for me about what, about how all of that came together, whether this was like a late onset issue that he had. I mean, I knew he'd been called Mad King George, but um, but I didn't know if that was something that was late onset. It was it was it something like, did she have to watch this deterioration? Did she know ahead of time? And, and that kind of thing. And so I was interested to kind of see where they, what they were going to do with the story and how much story that there would be, because, you know, something that's a little different than, than what we normally get with, with a story like this is that we know that the two of them are still together, you know, whatever that is 30 years later, right? 30, 40 years later, we know that you kind of go, okay, well, what's the suspense here? You know what I mean? (laughs) yeah yeah and then and so when I got into the story I just assumed it was going to be like really focused on on those two and maybe some palace intrigue or something along those lines and so I was kind of surprised at how 
at how much the series focused on the female friendships. And we know about the friendships sort of from the first two Bridgerton series. We know that these are folks that interact on a regular basis and spend time together. So to see the very beginnings of those friendships early on is just a really fascinating and a really interesting choice that Shondaland made to go in that direction. And then when they had the opportunity to show the the older version of each of the characters, where those friendships are, and also how they have deepened and changed over time. I thought that was really a great way to create a little bit more story, but also to keep me engaged in a different way that I was not expecting to be engaged. And like Yvonne said, I read a lot of romance novels. I love romance novels. So generally I'm all about like that relationship, but to see the women characters and the way that they support each other and lean on each other, that I thought was really, really well done and made it just that much better of a story overall. All right. So Stacy, what about you? How did you first hear about it? Was it a homework assignment? What did you think? Okay, well, I was excited when it came up on my Netflix thing that it was something to watch. I was like, oh, something to watch. But it wasn't an assignment for me because I did enjoy the first two seasons of Bridgerton. And once they said Queen Charlotte, I was intrigued because, I mean, I know the history of their relationship. And even though in the first two seasons, she is not the main figure, but she is a big influence in both two in the especially the first two seasons but mm-hmm. we didn't get a real glimpse of it we got like jennifer said we got taste of it so we got to see a little bit of there was that one scene when she was having dinner with george and he was like you killed our daughter and you see the look on her face that you know there's more to it and if you know the history you know there's a lot more to it but i wasn't sure how shonda how they were going to do that in this season Mm -hmm. And because we knew they're married because they have to be married. So not only is it, it's not really a love story in the sense that two people meet and they fall in love. It's like, no, you're married and you find love or you find something to keep this marriage going. So that was one of the things that she did very well. But I also like the fact that they had such, I guess, diversity in it. And I, when I mean by diversity, I mean just a diverse and multiple storylines. And it was stuff that you typically don't really see a lot of, especially you had dollies in one in one season or one show. So we have Queen Charlotte, King George. We have that. We see Lady Danbury and Lord Danbury and her relationship with that. But how, you know, about the great experiment, which I know when we were watching the first Bridgerton, we talked about how we didn't care how it came about. We know it's not real. But they did a good job of how it came about. It was a better explanation, but at the same time, when I was watching it, and they're like, they talked about the colonies. I was like, yeah, because my ass is in the colonies. He's still slaves. We talking about the great experience. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. But but yeah, it was no experiment over there. But uh, they at least tried to explain it up of how that came to be. And then you have Lady Bridgerton and an older woman. Wanting, you know, wanting her garden tended. I need my garden. Tended. My garden is in bloom. <laughs> I just, and that's probably one of your ass, like one of those things that really stuck with me was that, her. But you never, you don't hear that a lot. You don't see things of that, that she's acknowledging what's going on with her like that. Yeah. And then you had the two, I don't know, are they footmen or mate? The king's man and the ladies man. I'm not sure what they are actually called or but their relationship and there's so much going on in this show and all these different storylines and they all kept my interest overall I was just really surprised I really was kind of in shock and all because I if I go by the first Bridgerton and then the second and then this Queen Charlotte Bridgerton story is like it's edging out to be one of the best ones I've gone over because that it's not a common love story and how they did it was in such a way that kept me interested the whole time. I just really enjoyed it. Since you did mention things that kind of stuck with you, one thing I wanted to do with everyone here is I want you to tell me what you thought stuck with you the most and let us all talk about it. 
And I noticed you said one thing that stuck with you was the garden and bloom that was one and the great experiment. But what what did really stick with you after the fact? Was it that? And tell us why it stuck with you. Well, I guess when they talked about the relationship between those two women and they're older. So again, you don't see that as much. And the fact that she's like, the, how they said it without actually saying it and she's like my gosh it is in bloom and lady Dan Bear is like it's winter time nothing's blooming right now and she's right. like no my garden is in bloom and it, then her eyes like your garden is in bloom <laughs> you know it's the same thing over and over again until it finally clicks what she means about the garden in bloom yeah. and how that perspective was for both of them like she's just now feeling her garden is in bloom again because her and her husband had a lovely garden together. Right. While if right. you go by Lady Danbury, we know her, he was just mowing grass and leaving. I mean, it was not, he was not tending to her garden. He was just pulling, <laughs> yanking weeds and I'm gone. And that was it. And when she later on has a garden and like she said, I tended it vigorously. That just, stuck with me well just really all that because how lady danbury saw her marriage how lady bridgerton saw her marriage and how her and then mm -hmm. queen charlotte we were discussing yeah. and again it's not really one key thing but i guess one theme that continually i really liked was that three different marriages three different part of perspectives because yeah. when queen charlotte was like brimsley paper and charcoal and she, I'm drawing pictures and I was like did they ever show the pictures I want to see the pictures um the pictures <laughs> they didn't show them for a long period of time <laughs> but they did show the pictures yeah we got but, a sneak peek of a few of the pictures yeah so yeah. it was just and you know how I am I'll be walking all around when I'm watching it but um, when she did that and she was like how she did not like it but Queen Charlotte finds out she does and right. it's just the marriages of three and just how each one of them had a different type of marriage but each one of them and how it affected each one of them in youth and how they are when they become older and I just don't think we typically see that I mean a lot of times when we see love stories or rom-coms it's always that oh what's that first love that that just starts kind of romance but we often don't see what happens or how it affects them years from that that point and by going back and forth we get to see how those different perspectives affected those women and made them who they are mm -hmm. um okay. and so i guess that was probably one of my thing it was that theme alone was that about these women discovering themselves and finding themselves and it's just and three different perspectives of the marriage. And maybe I'm thinking of that way too, because, you know, I'm watching, and I do like the love story of Charlotte and George, but I'm coming from it from a person I've never been married. And I got my parents to watch it. And so I asked my mom what she thought about it. And she was like, how oh, was I figure out it was, they were going back and forth? Because she didn't realize they were going back in the past and forth. She wasn't really, because she's never seen any of the Bridgerton stuff. And so she was like, and how they just stuck to it. Your marriage thick and thin. And her perspective, because she's been married for umpteen years. But I think, and that makes her a different perspective than that, from my perspective of it. But I did like the fact that it showed women at different stages in their lives. And how their relationships, that you can still have a relationship. You can still have feelings. You can still have one of your garden can no regardless of your age. That can right. happen. And so that's one of the things I liked about it was because of that. You had this young love you had this older love you had this gay romance I mean you had pretty much everything in this show without to me being overly forced yeah so right. it's like these are just all these people in this community and we're just seeing the snippets of their lives versus we're trying to force this storyline in here and we're trying to make a point with this storyline but you're making a point with everything, but it's just natural. 
it naturally happens. What did everybody else think about that? The, the view of marriage, the view of relationships in this kind of ensemble cast. And, so, yeah. I was going to say, I kind of want to piggyback off what Stacy was saying in terms of what this left me with. And this is, plays into why I haven't finished the series. So I think we get plenty of instances, we've talked about this in books and romance books, of young love. We see that all the time. And that's great and fabulous, right? And we expect it to be great and fabulous. It's young. But there is something to be said, and obviously this probably matters to me more now because I'm older. There's something to be said to seeing this play out with older people and particularly women and so to me that's what I actually like about this series more than any, anything else and I know a lot of people were here for the Charlotte and George stuff I was here for the Agatha Violet and Charlotte kind of stuff that that is why I was here as I began to watch it that is what resonated with me and what I want to see more of so that actually led up to why I was disappointed so they were going to cut these women's stories off at this point, even though I don't really think they're going to cut them off. But at this point, when I'm watching this, I'm like, you're getting ready to look. Sex in the City had six seasons. Why am I only getting six episodes from these three women that I am so excited to see how their lives are here forward? Not just what they were when they were younger. That backstory is great and beautiful and needed and it helps me understand them older. But now I want to watch these ladies move forward. I want to see the things that they do now in their lives and the conversations and things that they have. I was so excited about that. And I knew I wasn't going to get it because the show was getting ready to end. So honestly, what I would love to see, I want to see spin -off, spinoffs of all of these, <laughs> of these ladies. Because to me, that's what just resonated the most with me. And I, I felt like overall, they did a great job of making even not the other relationships. I felt everybody's relationship with each other within the story. I feel like they did a phenomenal job writing as well as acting. But I was really here for those three ladies. The only other thing I just want to mention, because I don't think we often talk about this, is I want to give shout out to makeup artists. Because we all know when we saw Laura Danbury, we wanted to vomit. And so it was yes. just like, but if you yes, see yes. what he really looks like, yeah, and I had to admit, I was like, oh, I know nobody looked like this exists. No, I'm joking. But I had to immediately go and look and see who was playing this man. Right. Because, and it wasn't just that he looked bad, but he, given how we first meet him and what's going on. All I was like, oh, my yeah. God, poor woman. <laughs> you know, right, whatever. exactly. I mean, you know, you know we, we first meet him. Yeah, he's having yeah. sex. And two, because here we are, we are, you know, six women who are independent and in our own thing. And to hear the disregard that he has for women. Granted, this is a different time, <laughs> but... As I was watching it, I was like, Lord Danbury, I really, I don't know how she's still smiling and how she don't punch you in the face. And I think for me, what I often found was the moments where, that I was intrigued by were the moments where she did look at him endearingly, where yes. she did put on the empathy of the situations he was going through. Some of the decisions she made were to further this desire that he had not just for herself but because she recognized what it felt like for him and that she could in some ways alleviate some of that and I yeah. know that she got annoyed every time he didn't give due credit and I think that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why she made the choices um about what her future would look like but I did like that they showed that even in a marriage like that there will be times where people can care about each other despite an inauspicious start, let us say. That there are times in any relationship that lasts that long that there will come times where one partner or the other at different times feels something more than just disdain for one another. I also think, and I guess for me, I realized that we would get to see more of them because they are still 
key to all of the other Bridgerton stories to come. Violet is the mother of the Bridgerton children. We'll continue to see her. Lady Danbury is the head of the ton. So I didn't feel a loss for them. But what I do feel is, Dana, that you didn't get to see the last scene. Because the two exactly. things that stuck out to me most exactly. were, one, the dynamic between Lady Danbury and Violet when they come to that detente, let us say, where uh-huh. she recognizes that sometimes you don't really want to know, right? That it's best to leave things where they are in order to move forward. And I think that was something we don't talk about in relationships sometimes. Sometimes to move forward, you got to not open that door. Sometimes you have to just accept it that you do know what you think you know. But if you want to move forward, you're going to have to not consider that in your present because it was part of of someone else's past. And I think the way that they did that was really well done. And the poignancy of that last scene, and it was replayed all over the internet and every time, and I'll still watch it. Um, There's something about that last scene of seeing them old and seeing what has endured in spite of circumstances, situations, and even moments of, of mental lack of mental clarity that there are moments when two hearts can still remember who so in those moments of clarity where he looks at her and you can tell that for a moment he recognizes her and you see what that means to her you see what it looks like on her face and then you see that last shot of just their feet underneath the bed so much in that last scene that stuck yeah. with me and I think that's the saddest part for me is that Dana you didn't get to see it and feel it because there's there's something so beautiful and powerful about it so and now Marcy, I did now even though I did not see it I'm aware of what happened because I've read about it, it. so even though it's I not the same not I'm not saying it's the same I don't know that whether it would have been the same for me versus you because I felt different if I had not known that was the end and watched it maybe but knowing that that was going to end I don't think even if I watched it, it would have changed how I felt because again that was not really what I found myself here for. So I understand that and I, I'm aware of how hard she dealt with it and getting under the bed and all that. And I'm also aware of Lady Danbury and Bridgerton, you know, and what happened with them too. So I think only way I would have felt the way you felt, Marcy, is if I hadn't known it was going to end, right? But knowing it was going to end, I kind of lost, like, uh, because I just felt like there's no way in 30 minutes you're going to give me what I want out of this it's gonna and yeah we're gonna see their stories as part of Bridgerton thank goodness but I love them so much I wanted to see their stories (laughs) like when I look back on it and like season one or whatever like I feel like the young characters the young lady characters who don't know anything about life and the world and stuff the depth just compared to this was just not there and so I'm just like torn that I want more of this than what we were getting with Richardson. And I know that's not the, and I, and I feel like to Stacey's point, it's unfortunate because I feel like we don't often focus on that kind of stuff and what it's like in the older. So I think, again, I, I totally agree. It would have been different had I watched it and not known that that's, because it would have caught me totally off guard. I'm absolutely sure I would have a different feeling. But once I knew, and then knowing that my, draw to the show was not George and the Queen because this is going to sound sucky but I kind of felt like the role of dealing with somebody who is going through an ongoing illness or whatever and you're basically well I don't feel like she came as much of his caregiver because she had help as when other people have to do this and I can't even imagine what it's like I know that has to be kind of like the worst role in the world I, I remember there was this guy and he was just confessing to people that he is now not only his wife's husband but her caretaker and he cannot do both of those so I'm fully aware of what that looks like and how tough that must be in terms of just knowing about it so that wasn't really like I watched it and watched it play out and it was very heartfelt and just saw the struggle and it was tough, but that was not where I was the most interested. I guess I have to say, I was really much more interested in the women's relationship with each other. And then Lady Danbury is just like my favorite. (laughs) So I hear what you're saying, but don't be concerned that you think I've missed out on something because I really don't think that 
I did. And, and frankly, we'll never know anyway. It doesn't matter. But just knowing what's happened, I can imagine what it looked like and how it would have felt heartfelt and stuff. But I would have rather skipped all that and just saw more of my girls. <laughs> you know question Dana if they said oh we're having a season two of Queen Charlotte would you finish that last episode oh I plan to finish it I'm not gonna mm-hmm. not finish it right now I'm kind of in my feelings about it that's the only reason I haven't finished it is because okay. I, I feel some kind of way but yeah I do plan to finish it I'll okay. finish it before the just, third uh, season and I of love it was a beautiful scene I was oh, I it trying. was it was a beautiful scene Pam I trying. think you tried to say something Oh, no, I was, Marcy, when you were talking about the scene, I remember those last scenes where they were showing where they were older and then he looked at her and he saw her as that young, beautiful Charlotte that he met in the beginning. And then when she looked at him, she saw him as being that young, just George that she met early on. So I thought that was just beautiful. And of course, Sean, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it it just it was really sweet and it tied all of it together and it made me want to go ahead and start watching Bridgerton all over again just by how that beautiful moment ended. I said, okay, let's go back into Bridgerton and kind of how all of this connected for me. So I truly love that scene. And the other thing I was going to go back to, which was a little talking a little bit about George, one of the things um, that really stuck with me was when he was fighting with his mother, Princess Augusta, and he screamed out that he realized that he was born for the happiness or the misery of a great nation. So, I mean, that spoke volumes for me. And it also kind of played into all the inner things he had to deal with, with his mental illness. So, I mean, he was having to live this life. He wanted to just be George. He wanted to look at the stars look at the planets but then he also knew he had such a weight and a responsibility on him that that probably would have drove me crazy but then he marries Charlotte and it's almost like Charlotte comes in and is born for this role of being right there with her husband and helping him to run this nation which is really what she did and even to a point where she was running things so I think that quote just really said something and it spoke volumes to who George thought he was and how Charlotte came in and truly helped to make him who he was, at least on the side of the royal side of things. It was nothing she could do really about the mental health side, but she did help to make him um, the best king that he could be in the situation where they were. So that was something that stuck out for me. Yeah, you mentioned at one point she was really kind of running things. And it was funny because there was this one episode because George IV is the real regent, right? Because she can't be. He was made the regent. But uh, she was saying, oh, okay, yeah, he's the regent. Hey, George, tell them that this is what's going to happen. So I was like, yes. She was really running things behind the scenes there. It was, it was funny to see that. But it was kind of like she was, she was born for this role of support and kind of getting back to getting back to a little bit of what Stacey or piggybacking a little bit on what Stacy was saying about seeing these women and various relationships and various times in their lives and how these relationships shape their lives with Queen Charlotte she's married pretty much for the long term as we know from history and from Our fictional knowledge of the Bridgerton story, we see that Violet loved her husband who was taken from her. And then we see Lady Danbury, who didn't really like her husband at all. Oh, but seeing these different relationships and how they kind of made these women who they were, it almost like feels like they were solidified in who they were. These relationships just help solidify these women into who they were. None of them feel dependent on their man, right? Mm -hmm. None of them. And you were also talking about that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense in terms of who they were. And even with Lady Danbury, when she has the affair with Lord Bridgerton, 
-hmm. even though that was an affair and she had already lost her husband, but she got a chance to have that moment of love again. But it was almost like that was enough for her. And then she went on and helped so many other couples, which she helped Charlotte. She later on helped the Duke. She helped the Sharma family. She helped yeah. all of these relationships come together. And, and it was because of that moment that she realized who she was. Yes, yeah, she, she had that bad relationship. That was a purpose. She had that affair. Okay, that was a purpose. But now this is her purpose for the rest of her life. And it just really showed who she was and what she was made to be in the midst of all of that. And yeah. technically speaking, we don't know if that was the last time her garden was tended to. It's just the woman <laughs> no, in that. Yeah, we don't know that yet. Which is why that garden this... I mean, exactly. she may have, you know, that just might have been open that it could be more to it. But I really like I think her. it is. I think, huh? I think yeah. that, because in my mind, because I'm remembering one of the other Bridgerton things, she's, she's telling one of the younger ladies how she has lived. She, lived, them, she had a life. That's right. She had remember. a life. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking there was more than just that one affair. One, it, I'm, I'm thinking there's something else that I don't think that's having lived. I mean, yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. I no, I, I don't, be. I don't think so either. We're seeing the beginning of who she is. And then we're going to see more of how that has evolved over time. I think we're going to end up seeing a little bit more. Now, you know, granted, I haven't read the novel, so I, I don't know if that is even a factor in there. But I think... I don't think it matters. This is Shondaland. Yeah, yeah, this, really this is Shondaland. As Dana was talking about with these women, I kind of had... Not really a similar feeling, but more like a, oh my gosh, at first when I sat down to watch, I didn't even say about how I started watching this, but when I first sat down to watch, I looked at it because I needed to know how long I was going to be sitting and watching this. And I saw, well, it's only six episodes. I'm like, okay, cool. All right. I'll be good with these six episodes. But then as I watched, I was like, how are they going to wrap this up in six episodes? <laughs> when is this going to happen? And as you see King George, as you see his madness go on, I'm going back and looking at history and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is not going to end well, but it's supposed to be a romance. So it needs to end well. So how is she going to actually wrap this up? And so I was feeling a little bit of angst, I guess, about the whole Queen Charlotte, King George, how that was going to be wrapped up to be an HEA kind of feel. But everybody's right. That last scene that does it for me is beautiful. And history be damned <laughs> with whatever actually did happen. I love the way this was wrapped up. Shonda did it. But unlike Dana... To me, this is just kind of a bridge for Viscountess Bridgerton and Lady Danbury. I think we're just going to see more of them moving forward and more of their own relationship stuff, even though we know that Bridgerton stories, the romance is really centered around the Bridgerton children. But I mean... Again, it's Shondaland, so we could see whatever happened, especially when you have a fan base that may be actually clamoring for something, like seeing older women find love on screen. I'm all about that. And I so, also, that was me. I thought that six episodes was the sweet spot. There are times where I don't make it to the end of a season because it's got 10 episodes and I just don't have it. I felt like that six episodes was bingeable. I did get it done in a weekend. For a prequel, I felt like it was perfectly timed out. I think that you're right. It was kind of a teaser. It was something to get us to the next season. And in my mind, it was to utilize characters who weren't filming that season. You know, these these characters weren't large parts of what we know season three to be but yeah i like the six episode prequel concept and i hope that she continues to do these kind of bridge episodes again 
And Dana, maybe you'll get your wish and we'll get another bridge episode between the next season where they expand on more about the middle part. But I think it did make me feel better knowing I would get to see them in the regular episodes in the regular season. But these were six very well done episodes and it was just enough without being too much. So let me ask you this, because I can see that for the Charlotte George relationship. I can see that being a sweet spot. Six episodes, I think they did a great job. It's almost like they made this just too good. <laughs> yes. I don't want to go back to the old Bridgerton. I'm, I want the old Bridgerton. Yes. I want them to be the side this characters. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I but think, I think, well, well, I think also we are a little bit soured on season two. I don't know that this was just really good. Yeah. <laughs> and I do I think I am looking forward to season three because I want to see where they decide to go because they are not in book order anymore so I want to see where they decided to go because of where the previous season went but right. I think that this season also benefited from a different I think you're right all of the things that we've been saying this was a mature group of people didn't have some of the what we would consider childish or mundane type issues that we see in the Bridgerton novel created series and so I think maybe that's why it resonated with us but at the same time I am interested to see the actual Bridgerton series because I did enjoy season one I think season two suffered every season two pitfall that there is the curse of a second season everybody's still trying to find their place and sometimes you nail it and sometimes you don't most series don't if they get to three four or five things get back on track and maybe that's what this was maybe it was a redemption song for all the feedback that she got about season two being <laughs> meh so it could be but whatever it was it was executed at the highest level i think it does give the rest of the bridgerton series actors something to aspire to or to reference in terms of how you make impact in smaller time spans and how you make impact and I mean Golda is a beast at just her face making saying everything so I know um, right so it's Ajua as Lady Danbury they are marvels and making their faces say what words can't and I think that that's something that maybe the younger cast over time as they grow in experience will also benefit from the story was just interesting and I would also like to say if anybody had ever watched Mr. Malcolm's List we could have had a quality conversation about season two of Bridget and versus Mr. Malcolm's List and the interesting characteristics of both. However, no one else has watched it yet. So I'm challenging the rest of us to watch it so that we can have that quality discussion as well. Thank you. I did watch it and I look forward to doing that. Thank you, Payne. <laughs> we go again with Mr. Malcolm's List. <laughs> Love it. I, I, I love it a little better. This is kind of off the subject, but bring it up the Bridgerton stuff real quick. What I'm most looking forward to, and I think we probably talked about this when we talked about Bridgerton, the second season, but the reason three I'm actually slightly excited about is I need to see how Shonda's going to make me not hate what we are expecting to be the second main character whatever that season like I'm not sure how I'm expected to want them to to fall in love so I'm thinking that because we already said spoiler alert please just make it plain make it plain Dana <laughs> well I don't remember his name <laughs> oh Colin Colin, Colin. yeah I don't know how yeah. we're expecting Colin like and Penelope is next yeah yeah, so I don't know how we're expected to like Colin. After what I saw in season two, I very much did not want Penelope to ever marry him or be with him. He does not deserve her. So it'll be very interesting. If they can make me change my mind, y'all, I'm here for it. Oh, well, and it's going to be hard. <laughs> well, I think this makes me feel better about that, about that season three of Bridgerton or about their relationship because of how they just really delved into charlotte's character queen charlotte's good character. point good. when we saw her she's the queen everybody's fearful of her and how you see how she became what she became and just that story how it just humanized her when you see the first one she's just i'm the queen i'm the one who does who's the diamond of the first war to this season all that stuff and how she became the person she became and they did it a great job of it 
I mean, because I think Pam mentioned like how you felt about her in the first two seasons. She wasn't like the most likable character. <laughs> she was the queen and she didn't necessarily do anything. I'm sorry, horrible, horrible, but it was just, she wasn't warm. She didn't give you the warm and fuzzies at all. Yes, yeah, she did not. She did not. But they made how they humanized her and how she became the queen and how she was treated and how first she liked to do stuff for herself by herself. And then she realized if she did that, people would lose their jobs. I just want to pick my own orange. It's like, and then yeah. when I'm orange people, they have no jobs. Their family will be starving now because you want to pick exactly. up your own orange and how she changed because of that. But it wasn't a change because she wanted that for some people like, I got like to pick my own. But she knew if she did that, other people would suffer. She learned that kind of thing. And it made her more of a human being. And if, if she can do that with Charlotte, I'm just like, okay, well, let's see what we can do. With... First, with I wasn't sure you do it. Colin. <laughs> I wasn't sure you it at the end of season two. I was like, yeah, I don't see season three. Bit. I don't see. I'm not sure how I'm going to like them. You know, Colin and all that kind of stuff. But and I'm like, now it's like, okay, Shonda. You did it. On You're, right. I think You're you, right. You, you are be, right. You, you, you are right. absolutely right. If anybody yeah. can do it, I believe she can. So I'm excited to see what she does. We know? believe in you, Miss Shonda. We, we sure believe do. in you. <laughs> yes, we do. we do. Jen, you've got your mic open. Did Did you have something to say? I on did the... want to say something. Okay. Here's what I will tell you about Colin. I was doing a workshop for romance writers and I said something about the Bridgerton series and a favorite, and I just made reference to somebody's favorite character. And I kid you not, there were multiple people in the audience that said, oh, Colin. And I was like, I'm actually not going to talk about Colin, but that's hilarious that you guys of the entire Bridgerton series, that's the name that came to mind. So I have not read that book, but that was the response from folks that had read the whole series. So I have high hopes. Interesting. To pull off. So there may, so in other words, there may be something back there that Shonda can pull out of the hat. It's got <laughs> layers. I'm just gonna say yes, layers, layers. So yes, here we go with layers. Oh my god! Tragic childhood. He was beat in his youth. <laughs> He used to be plus size and he lost all this weight myself. So oh, well, he's yeah. the Bridgerton link, so he has to okay. So oh. Jim, while you were and even though we may have dried that well of Colin and Penelope, let's get back to kind of what stuck out for people. I know we talked a lot about a few different things here, but is there anything for you as far as the Queen Charlotte of Bridgerton story that just stuck out for you that maybe we haven't mentioned yet or that you want to piggyback on? Well, we haven't talked a whole lot about, about Remington and Brimsley. They're side characters. We don't get a whole lot of information about them except for their role in supporting the king and the queen. But we get this whole like miniature love story between the two of them. They're already together clearly when the show starts. So just two people in love that are sometimes at odds and sometimes working together and trying to maintain this very strange amount of workplace romance. In secret, obviously it has to be in secret. Obviously. Um, but I love their storyline. I love the conflict that they have between the two of them when they disagree about what to do. But I think in that disagreement, we see from both of them this really deep level of, of commitment to their sovereign, that they are there to protect this person. They literally like spend their lives protecting this person and doing what they can for their life. Whether it is explaining a little bit about the way the world works between Charlotte and Brimsley, whether it is, did I call him Remington? His yeah, he's, he's Reynolds. Reynolds. Yeah. It's all good. Sorry about that. And when Reynolds is trying to figure out how to protect the king from Monroe, the doctor. Yes. He needs this instinct that he wants to protect and take care of him and somehow find a way to save him. 
And what I really appreciated was that the two of them could argue and they could be at odds and the way that they could then come back together. And over time, right, that's indicative of an overall healthy relationship, although they have to obviously remain in secret for so long. But the fact that they can argue and they can come back together, it's this interesting, we talked earlier about about the three different marriages that we see over the course of this. And this is a relationship that we see that is really healthy and, um, and is a wonderful example of a healthy relationship. So it's very out of all the other ways that these people are coming together and how these people relate to each other in the other relationships, it seems the most normalized to me, you know? Yeah, that's a good way to put yeah. it. Right? And, and it's interesting that it seems the most normalized to me because back in the day, this would be, of course, banned for so many different reasons. But what I really liked about their relationship too a little bit is you had these little moments especially the moments when Queen Charlotte and King George were in the beginning of their marriage and they were almost acting like parents <laughs> like parents mm -hmm. you know like your boy needs to do something get her a gift oh and right then, and, see, you know, and, like, and then I, you I, end up with the dog you know how it is when you get it's like it's like you, the parent, you know, is like, I'm ended up taking this dog out <laughs> after we've given the kids a dog and then the parent ends up taking the dog. Out. So it was almost kind of like a parent relationship going on yeah. in King George <laughs> and Queen Charlotte were their kids. That That's to me was, was hilarious, but it normalized them even more in my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I think their relationship was the closest to modern day relationships in a yeah. way because yes i don't know about lady bridgerton but everybody else were arranged marriages they were together truly because they loved each other they liked each other they chose to be together and mm -hmm. i mean which yep. is what you enjoy of seeing them together and just like you said like the so when their pants were like barely touching through the gloved hands or the scene where they were dancing and then the end when it was just one and I'm like it was sad and that was we okay. really want, I would like to know more about so I cannot so what did we think happened because in my mind Reynolds died but other people had <laughs> all kinds of other too. theories but I, in my I, re mind, I researched this a little bit so I won't talk about what I said what I, said, I mean I've seen I, a lot of other theories since yeah. then but when I was watching it, in my mind, Reynolds died. That's it. Yeah. That's the only way that he would have left. The that king. Was, that was, mm -hmm. That's service. exactly where my head went. He died. When, they, when, yeah. when he was dancing alone, he, they went from dancing together to dancing alone. I'm like, oh, he died. That's so sad. But they still clearly had this love between them that he celebrates. And that's beautiful. Yvonne, yeah. what did you find out? Because I totally agree. I thought he died. I thought that's the only thing that could have happened. That they had an extra scene in there that they had to cut, and the extra scene was them kind of telling they they were breaking up basically because they couldn't be together because they're two men. So that that scene was never yeah. It's then it's I'm gonna keep my memories that Reynolds died. And I right exactly. I don't like that. I don't want that in, in the universe. So maybe that's why they cut that scene. And not necessarily showing a death, but just showing that he was dancing all along. Because I felt that same way too. And I'm like, why did I go and research this? I don't like the way this came out. But getting back to their relationship and Stacey, you're right. It's like they chose each other. That's how a lot of people get together nowadays. <laughs> not very many arranged marriages out there. There was, there was one thing though I, I just thought was just totally funny with their relationship is when they were getting everything ready for the king and queen, their party or their ball to announce the birth of George IV. And Reynolds was just acting like a total bride villain. It was almost like they were prepared for a wedding. And Brimsley was like, I am the queen's man. And he was like, well, I'm the king's man. And he's like, these flowers are wrong. And, and Brimsley was just like, 
shaking his head and just, I, I got to walk away from this. This is like too much. You get too into this. And it, it was just so funny. Another little detail that just normalizes their relationship. They're just in love and it's just cute and it's just fun. So Dana, you talked a little bit about kind of what you wanted to see or what you ended up liking about this. Is that also like the thing that stayed with you? Or was there like something else maybe that really stuck with you? So for me, the women's relationship is really what stood out to me and what I really took away from that. If I had to, I mean, there were a lot of things like I know mentioned earlier with the costumes, like I, there seems to be unlimited budget for these shows and I'm, I'm there for it. Everything I know, looks right? beautiful, you know, it's yes. great. But yeah, I want to specifically earlier say just like the makeup and the costumes. I think a lot of times people don't really talk about that, but that's what makes us fall in love with these shows too because the visual wasn't there. Then it wouldn't matter what they were saying to each other. It wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't even watch it. So I just wanted to say that it's beautiful just to watch it and everything and all the work that they did. But the ladies' relationships, I'm just like, oh my gosh, that, that was my main thing. Stay tuned for part two of this discussion. In the meantime, check out our website, nerdyromanticspodcast.com for any episodes that you may have missed. And while you're there, click the subscribe button to subscribe to our newsletter. That way you get show notes and other good information right in your inbox. Thank you for listening. Star date, not too distant future. Brandon is a diehard Trekkie. He's watched every Star Trek franchise episode multiple times. He has several cosplay and collectible uniforms in his closet. Commander Will Riker is his favorite cosplay character, and he's been to dozens of conventions. But he's never met or gotten in a fight with another Trekkie like Phoenix. Phoenix is looking forward to her first Star Trek convention until she meets Brandon. He's nothing like the Riker character she loves to hate. He's combative, socially awkward, and off-putting. But he's so adorable. Phoenix and Brandon keep running into each other, each time more heated than the next. With three days of convention to get through, will they get past the hostility and find what they know is there? Attraction and perhaps love? This is the premise of Stardate, a free e-story for my newsletter subscribers, available on February 1st. If you like Trekkie romance, romantic comedy, or just like to see a little grumpy sunshine trope, this story is for you. Go to ymnelson.com backslash subscribe and get your free copy.